Okay, I lied. Uh, there are just a couple other things I wanted to tack on um, about um, water and salt physiology before we moved on to the, the last chapter in the course. Um, <clears throat> going back to our friend, the kangaroo rat here. Um, if we look at kind of a broader brush overview of what's going on here, uh, remember that he makes a lot of metabolic water, just like you and I do. And if we look at his rate of water loss, right here in red, as long as we can keep this line right here, total water loss, below this line right there, we do not have to do anything. Okay, we do not have to, <coughs> excuse me, we do not have to really do, you know, drink any water. Technically, we wouldn't have to eat any food, but obviously we have to eat food. Um, and so one of the, the key aspects of this might be, Kind of is terrible here. One of the key aspects of this here is what the ambient humidity is, right? As the ambient humidity increases, right, as the water around us and the air around us gets more and more and more, we lose less and less and less and less of this, primarily here to evaporation, okay? If we look at the line between the, the lines here, water loss due to evaporation, and the lines loss, water to urine, total water loss here altogether, right? They're all parallel, right? Which is to say, this amount right here, and this amount right here, and this amount right here are all the same. The amount of water he loses or she loses to urine and to feces is constant okay the only change that we experience is this water loss due to evaporation so as we get humider and humider and humider and humider we lose less and less and less evaporation number one that's good right also as we get humider and humider and humider and humider the amount of water in our air dried foods also increases okay so for our little shrew, or little shrew, our little kangaroo rat, the more humid the environment we live in, right, the happier we are, right? We minimize water loss, we maximize water gain, everybody's happy. So that's one thing to consider. The other thing to consider <clears throat> is that um, this assumes constant temperature. That is worse than my handwriting on the board. It assumes a constant temperature, right? Now, the one thing that we do know about metabolic rates and temperature for things like mammals is that the colder it becomes, or indeed, honestly, the hotter it becomes, metabolic rates increase, right? Because we have this thermoneutral zone, right, in which our metabolic rate remains constant. Above that, metabolic rate rises to lower our internal temperature. Low that metabolic rate lowers to raise our internal temperature. All this means for us, right, is that as long as we're kind of over here, right, as temperatures get colder and colder and colder, metabolic water production increases and increases and increases as metabolic rate also increases. Okay. What we can do then is take the ratio of metabolic water production and evaporative water loss. So remember, metabolic water production goes up, temp goes down, and evaporative water loss goes up as humidity goes down. And as moving a spacer, as temp 
goes down, humidity goes up. <clears throat> what we find, okay, is that there is a ambient temperature range for most of these animals. So here's our ratio of one. That <clears throat> as long as we can stay above one, right? So we're in this range up here, right? Where it's <clears throat> relatively cool, right? So our ambient temperature is pretty low and humid. We're okay. But as temperatures increase, right, or as you probably can't read this at all anymore, I scribble a little bit. As temperatures increase, right, go this way, <clears throat> or as humidity drops below here, as long as we're in this zone, this is a, this is our problem zone, right? And so what we find is that in this problem zone, we often see a switch in diet, okay? And that switch in diet for these animals usually occurs right around 30 degrees centigrade. Below this, wow, this is getting messy at this point. Below this, right, the air dried foods, seeds, nuts, shit like that. Above this, you see a switch in diet. Right? Insects full of moisture, they've got all these bodily fluids inside of them. Okay, they're harder to catch, but they have more water in them. So again, issue here is standing water is not available. So we see a change in diet with this ratio of metabolic water production to evaporative water loss. I guess the take home from this now current disaster of the slide is that we do see animals adapting to these different environments, primarily based upon food choices more than anything else. Okay. <clears throat> so the last thing we're gonna cover here, uh, kidneys and excretion. Um, related in obvious ways, I think, I hope, to uh, the last chapter here. <clears throat> the idea is how do we get rid of the things we need to get rid of through urine, so primarily things like um, metabolic waste products, excess vitamins, minerals, ions, whatever, and minimize water loss at the same time. That's what this is all going to be about. Okay. So the functional unit of the kidney, at least in vertebrates, and this is where we're really gonna, <clears throat> we're gonna spend most of our time here is in the vertebrate realm. The functional unit of the kidney is something called a nephron. And a nephron has two parts. It has a corpuscle, okay? And the corpuscle is for Okay, we produce a substance called filtrate. And the corpuscle itself is made of two things. We have a lom or rulus, which is a tuft of capillary. So this is the blood supply part of this thing. And then this guy right here, Bowman's capsule, which is the sort of the, the collecting area. So here at the corpuscle, we're going to filter out, based just on, excuse me, just on size, stuff from the blood. So anything smaller than, say, a big protein or a cell ends up in this filtrate. Okay, and the filtrate is collected here in Bowman's capsule. And then behind Bowman's capsule is the remainder of the nephron. The and in the tubule, we have two processes, and we'll talk about these a little bit later. Resorption and secretion. And what's going to happen here is we convert filtrate urine by adulterating 
this filtering by taking things out of it by putting things back into it. That's really the the story. The chapter's over, right? Uh, but obviously, there's obviously more more complicated parts of this. So let's start here by looking a little closer here at the corpuscle. Okay, so Bowman's capsule here. Okay, a tubule behind it, and inside this capsule we have the glomus lumus, which is this uh, little guy right there. Really, ultimately, all that happens here is that blood comes in here under pressure, not a lot of pressure, right? It's really, really low, right? Talking about very, very small overall pressures. 1.3 kPa is pretty small, uh, but it's enough to force the blood out through these little tiny little gaps in the capillary. This is the same thing that happens everywhere, this capillary, right? These capillaries happen to be pretty flimsy. They have a lot more holes in them than usual, but it's the same basic idea. So anything that fits these little gaps, and in turn, anything that fits the little gaps in the wall of Bowman's capsule gets dumped into this filter. So this is uh, electrolytes, um, vitamins, minerals, um, nitrogenous wastes, water, all kinds of stuff. It gets filtered out. <clears throat> and enters this internal space here, right, as filtrate. What we're going to do after this point um, is move things in and out of this now of this filtrate, um, primarily by moving one ion. Big ion here. One thing, if you remember one thing from how the kidney works, that we are moving sodium into and out of this filtrate, into and out of the blood. And as we do this, right, we change the osmolality okay, of these solutions, either the filtrate or the extracellular fluid. Okay. And in doing so, right, by changing the osmolality, we cause water to leave, water to enter, or leave, or water to enter, or whatever. Okay. In this way, we can start to move things into and out of it. Now, in a basic kidney, right, the kidney that most animals have, this, and this is all going to happen in the tube. In a basic kidney, most things we're never going to be able to achieve a fluid in the tubular filtrate more concentrated than the blood, right? That UP ratio is always going to be okay for most things, not everything, but for most things. We'll see in examples of other kidneys a little bit later on, kind of how we get away from that a little bit, but for right now, this is kind of where we're stuck with it. Okay, so let's start with a really, really simple vertebrate kidney. We're not, we're not going to go back to fish kidneys. They're, they're not terribly different from this, um, but they have a slightly different embryonic origin, so we're not going to worry too much about them here. We are instead going to start with an amphibian kidney, and the way the amphibian kidney is set up is that we have our corpuscle right here, and then the tubule behind it is divided into three segments. And this three segment tubule is going to be the basis for generally all terrestrial vertebrate kidneys across the board. So the first part is going to be this thing right here, the proximal convoluted tubule or PCT. And the PCT is there to resorb 99% of the filtrate. Okay, so we just dumped a whole bunch of crap out of the blood, right? We squeeze the blood out, all that's really left are big protein, some water, cells. Almost everything else left. Here at the PCT, we resorb 99% of that filtrate that was back to the blood. Okay. However, because we dump a lot of stuff out of here, right? 
we run the risk of making this fluid really, really diluted. And so we also make sure the PCT is, is very, very permeable to water. So that as we move stuff back in, water can go with it. All right. So returning things to blood, returning things to the blood, process. After the PCT, we enter this relatively short intermediate segment, which is not important right now, but will become important later on. And then we transition into, into the somewhat longer distal convoluted tube or DCT. And here in the DCT, we do a lot of secretion. We return things from the blood back to the filtrate. Okay, so we dump everything out, we bring everything back in, and then we hand some stuff back. It's a unnecessarily complicated process, but again, it's just how it happened. Right? There's no, there's no guiding hand here. The, so the DCT eventually drains into one of these guys right here, which is a collecting duct. The collecting duct is attached to multiple nephrons and they all dump into here. Eventually this collecting duct enters out of the outside world and at that point we have urine. <clears throat> so if we look um, kind of at concentrations of fluids here as we pass from the corpuscle, ECT, ECT, one of the big things that we're gonna see here is that for the first part of our journey, right, all the way through here, because we are permeable to water, because as we move ions and other things, water goes with it, we are essentially isosmotic the whole way through, okay? But as we pass here into the DCT, the big change here with the DCT is that we're no longer permeable to water, okay? So as we start dumping things back into the filtrate, water doesn't necessarily go with it, okay? So whatever water is still in here is all the water we're going to have, right? And as we continue to add stuff, we end up um, changing that osmotic pressure. This is what allows uh, animals to control, to, to some extent, again, remember, always hypoosmotic, um, but control the amount of water that remains in the urine. The way that we do this, okay, the way that we alter the permeability of uh, the DCT to not to water necessarily, um, well, to water, uh, <laughs> thinking more about how we change um, sodium is with a hormone here we've talked about before called ADH or antidiuretic hormone. So two processes here, diuresis, And then it's going to uh, make you pee, right? Or so alcohol, for example, meth uh, ethanol. Don't drink methanol. Um, ethanol is a diuretic, right? So you go to the bar, you have a beer, and you have to pee. Um, and the way diuretics work is actually they they make you urinate more than the volume they bring in. Okay, so for every 12 ounces of beer you drink, you actually excrete about 18 ounces of, of urine. That makes sense. So an antidiuretic is something that's going to make you produce less urine. So ADH, all right, if you secrete a bunch of ADH, what this is going to do is it's going to make this tubule, this distal convoluted tubule, permeable to water. And so that as we pull sodium out of it, water will go with it and you produce less urine. Okay, at least less watery urine, more concentrated urine. So ADH makes you concentrate your urine more so than uh, it would normally do. Okay, so Let's leap forward here a little bit um, to talk about uh, kind of a 
the next big advance in kidney, I guess, uh, if you want to think about it that way. Um, and this is <clears throat> the link of which is the intermediate segment, right? This useless little dude right here, right? But writ quite large. And so in the middle of our proximal distal convoluted tubules, now we have this big long loop that goes down and comes back up. And what this is going to do, right? What this loop of Henley is going to permit us to do is concentrate our urine above that of the concentration of our blood. We're going to have hyperosmotic urine. So take a step back here for a second um, because we need to look at some kidney anatomy to make some of this stuff make sense. Uh, you can see it a little bit here, right, where we've divided kidney into two units, cortex and the medulla. But when we look at the kidney as a whole, okay, what we're seeing is that this cortex, as you might have guessed, is this outer layer, and the medulla is the middle layer within it. Okay, and the important bits here is that this, for the most part, right, our PCT, our DCT, our glomerulus, our Golden's capsule, all that stuff lives in the cortex. But the loop of Henle descends down into the medulla. And so the larger the medulla, the longer the loop of Henle, the more concentrated our urine can become. All right. So as you might have guessed then, all right, we can look at the thickness of the medulla as a guidepost to what kind of environment our mammal might live in. The more aquatic we are, and so things over here like beaver, water rats, moles, what have you, the more aquatic we are, the smaller, the thinner that medulla is. And the drier our life is, right, the more deserty we are, the bigger, the thicker, the more massive the medulla is. And in particular, the larger this structure is right here, the renal papilla, okay? That renal papilla is a bit of medulla that reaches down okay, into kind of almost into the ureter in some cases, where these loops of Henle all kind of send down and be really, 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 really long. And you can see that here, particularly things like a gerbil or a gerbil, your really, really massive renal papillae, whereas there's no papilla, say, here in a water rat, and we actually have a reverse kind of papilla here in a beaver, simply because they don't need to concentrate the urine nearly as much. Again, this comes down to a very simple relationship, right? You can draw a kind of a best fit line in here uh, between thickness and urine concentration. The thicker that medulla is, the longer the lupus of Henle, the more concentrated the urine we can produce. <clears throat> and if we look at three different life habitats, right? Deserty things here, kind of intermediate things, aquatic environments, these would be humic, xeric from before. We find that generally speaking, by body mass, right, there is a, a fairly consistent relationship that the more aquatic, the wetter the environment you live in, the thinner uh, the medullary tissue is. And again, we can kind of see this here drawn out like this, right? We've got <clears throat> lamb rat, Edis nerviticus, relatively small papilla, okay? Mongolian gerbil here, something that lives in the Gobi Desert, relatively large papilla, sand rat, this massive papilla. And in each of these cases, right, you can see these loops of Henley descending into that papilla, okay? All right, so we'll leave this one here. We'll come back, we'll do one more, one more video here kind of talking about physiology behind what's, what's actually happening here. Uh, I will also, in the second video, share with you some um, videos by another content creator, obviously, um, that does a 
in my mind, really the best job I've ever seen visualizing how we actually concentrate urine using these structures.